great speakers for you. Let me tell you about them. I'm taking them in alphabetical order because otherwise um, it becomes invidious to indicate. I was going to group them as lawyers and non-lawyers, but you can't actually do that because first up is Peter Aberley, who in fact is both. Yes, wave. He has uh, started his professional career as a project architect. He's a duly qualified barrister and an architect. He's an experienced arbitrator, mediator and adjudicator. He was listed as an adjudicator on the London 2012 Olympics adjudication panel. He's adjudicated Crossrail and BAA Terminal 5. He's listed on numerous panels, including the FIDIC President's List of Dispute Adjudicators and the ICC Canadian National Panel of International Commercial Arbitrators. He served on many committees concerned with arbitration and alternative dispute resolution, and he was one of the drafters of the construction industry model arbitration rules. He was for many years, and this is another theme from our panel, a visiting senior lecturer at King's College London and course director for the well-known MSC that they run. Now, our next speaker is the, uh, if I get my alphabetical order correctly, will be Matthew Finn who is a senior managing director at Ankura based in London. Matthew, I've got you there, haven't I? Yes, with, with the branding nice and visible behind and some form of disaster, I think, on the other side. What's, what's on the other side? Of the... should be, that should be London. <laughs> okay. I, I hope it's not a disaster. <laughs> it's looking as if it was tipped. He's <laughs> regularly appointed as an expert witness. So this is where we get Matthew with his expert witness hat on in the field of quantum damages in construction matters. And he does that in litigation, arbitration and mediation. And he has been both cross-examined and also given evidence concurrently, hot tubbing. He's a certified civil and commercial mediator, construction adjudicator and an international and domestic arbitrator. He's a panel adjudicator at the UK adjudicators at a UK adjudicators and regularly receives nomination through that panel. Next up, Sean Fishlock. Now he is a chartered constructor, chartered surveyor, chartered civil engineer, surveyor and project manager, Sean. Yeah, there he is. He's the managing director of the Barclay Research Group's uh, construction group, and he's worked with government departments, major funders, property developers, contractors, and engineering construction companies. Now he too, gives expert evidence in commercial and technical disputes on delay, project management and quantum. And he has worked with many interesting characters during his construction career, including Eddie the Eagle Edwards, a plasterer's laborer and our finest ski jump participant. Fred West of Infamy, who was a bricklaying foreman and Prince Charles, now, he hasn't told me the capacity in which he met, met Prince Charles, but he has summed it up beautifully by saying that he's used to dealing with gentlemen, characters and rogues, which has set him in good stead for dealing with arbitration, adjudication and court proceedings. I will leave it to you to decide which of the panel is a character, a rogue or a gentleman. Abdul Janadu is the netting barrister, adjudicator and arbitrator in Keating Chambers. He specialises in construction, engineering and energy disputes and domestic and international arbitration. And he has an extensive international practice specialising in Africa and the Middle East. And I suspect that he can run an arbitration in two languages as he's bilingual. Have you actually cross-examined in two languages, Abdul? No, I haven't. No, no, <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. No, but it, no. Will, it will soon come. I'm always in awe of people. I can barely do it in English and the thought of being <laughs> able to do it in another language as well would be extraordinary. Currently ranked in the Legal 500 Middle East Rankings and Chambers and Partners Global Rankings. Chapter author as well of various publications, including Keating on Construction con Contracts, Keating on Marine Engineering and Keating on NEC Contracts. Now, what you need to know about him though, and this puts him into, I think, into a completely special category, is that as a teenager, he learned the entire dialogue to the Empire Strikes Back. You just, you just got to admire him. 
Um, Daniel Miles is a, is a chartered, Daniel, where are you? Yep, got you. Is a chartered quantity surveyor by training and in practice working on large scale live projects. He too, for the past 15 years, has been a testifying expert witness on quantum issues in mediation, adjudication, arbitration, and litigation. He also acts as a mediator. He lectures at both Stuttgart University and Derby University on contract administration. And what you need to know about Daniel is that before becoming a quantity surveyor and starting his career in construction, he was involved with climate change research on glaciers in Norway. Now, that has got to be a job with prospects now. Finally, and bringing a true civil law German perspective to our work is Robert Worth, a civil engineer by training. He was a principal engineer and in company management. Since 2008, he's been a full-time dispute resolution practitioner, including as an arbitrator, adjudicator, and dispute board member. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and he too, like Peter, is on the FIDIC president's list, this one of the approved dispute adjudicators. He's listed on a number of panels, including the joint list of German Society for Building Law and the German Concrete and Construction Technology List. As an arbitrator, he's listed by the German Institute of Arbitrators and the German Maritime Association of Arbitrators. He's a FIDIC accredited international trainer, and he's a member of FIDIC's task group eight, updating one of their contracts at the moment. He's the first certified adjudicator in Germany, and he's the first publicly appointed and sworn expert for construction price and settlement in structural and civil engineering FIDIC conditions, which is a synonym for international contracts. Now I'm quoting him, these are his words, not mine. Neither German construction law nor German authorities are well known for their flexibility. So it took him seven years to provide sufficient proof that international contract elements are widely used in projects under German law, and therefore there was a public interest, and therefore he should get his certification. That's my panel, a very broad range of experience, a great deal of perspectives. We very much want this to be a dialogue, so please, if you could engage with us through the Q&A box, I've got it open and I'm, I'm going to keep it open. And we're going to try and take the questions as we go. I'm going to start, though, with the very first place to start. Our title is, do, is experts discharge their duties to the tribunal? Well, do they? And what are those duties? Let's try and make sense of that. And Matthew, I think we go over to you for your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, I mean, starting obviously with the, the key reason why an expert is appointed is obviously around independence and um, ensuring that they're giving independent views throughout. And I think, you know, first and foremost, that's obviously the, one of the most important, well, the most important thing that an expert's obviously there to do is to look at everything independently. But I, I think certainly those duties go wider um, than independence in the sense of that it's, it's also around um, not opining on, on areas which are outside of their expertise and, and not giving um, you know, opinions into, to matters that they're not, they're, they're not aware of or, or, or shouldn't really be opining on, um, particularly around issues such as legal. If they're not legally qualified, um, you know, they shouldn't really be telling the decision maker um, the law, particularly when they're the ones that are appointed to, to make that decision. Um, also as well, articulating their opinions to the point of where there's significant weight behind their um, opinions and, and, and how they get to those positions, but also making sure that those uh, opinions are, are articulated to everybody that they can understand how they reach those particular opinions, even if other people don't necessarily agree with what they, uh, where they get to. And I think really then that gives the benefit to a decision maker um, and not, not also just necessarily to a decision maker in any sort of dispute resolution forum, but also in the early stages to a client um, when they're trying to make decisions around progressing a dispute to a particular forum. Um, and that early advice from an expert can often uh, weigh into whether it actually progresses all the way to a formal dispute setting or whether um, there's an appetite to perhaps settle early. Um, or to, to certainly try and reach maybe a negotiation based outside of dispute resolution. The 
anyone else want to identify any other duties that they feel an expert ought to be performing, whether it is to the tribunal or to those who are paying? No, it's... Um, I would yeah, Abdul. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so I, I would suggest, I mean, in addition to the points that um, Matthew has so eloquently laid out, I think there is a, um, an obligation um, for the expert I think, to be truthful and honest with his um, employers. Um, I think there is, we, 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 one very often finds himself in a position where experts are under pressure to take a particular line or to um, uh, not to tell, you know, the, 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 the instructing solicitors or, or ultimate client, you know, the true facts <laughs> of the position. So I'll suggest, I mean, that, 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 that's an additional obligation that I'll suggest that, um, that uh, an, an expert would have. Yes, Peter. Well, I just uh, would uh, like to think that the duty that an expert owes may change over time, insofar as, uh, in my experience, when I acted more as counsel, uh, often one had an expert involved at a quite early stage in deciding whether or not there was a case at all, uh, and then obviously in assisting in putting that case together in formal pleadings, etc. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, and therefore at that point, the expert obviously has a duty uh, to give fair and impartial advice to his client and indeed to his counsel, uh, because there's no point in running a case that's hopeless. And certainly it's sometimes useful to hear in fact, more useful to hear about the warts in one's case than all the good points, because you can be pretty sure at the end of the day, it'll be the warts that emerge. And, and, um, but anyway, uh, the problem with that is that, of course, subsequently, if the matter proceeds, the expert will suddenly turn into an expert before the court and will have duties uh, to the tribunal. Uh, and and in, in various jurisdictions, particularly in this jurisdiction, England and Wales, those duties are, are, are seriously regulated by the rules of court. And uh, the point I would simply ask uh, um, those who act as experts, is there not a degree of schizophrenia between owing duties to the tribunal at the end of the day when they produce a report as evidence and the various uh, duties and discussions they have with the client at earlier stages and indeed during the course of the proceedings itself, because certainly sometimes during the course of cross-examination, one wishes to talk to one's expert uh, outside the courtroom in order to establish what lines of cross-examination might work, where the weaknesses are on the other side, where the strengths are, and to, to assist with cross-examination. And those huge slew of range of duties are not wholly compatible with each other, uh, particularly when the court seems to require the expert to divvy up all the contacts they've had with their client. And I simply do not know how that puts together. Though I do remember years ago being told that one definition of an expert was a squirt under pressure. And I can certainly sympathize with that view. And I'd like to hear from the experts about how they, how they square that circle uh, and the schizophrenia that I see being involved. Well, there we are experts. Do you feel schizophrenic? Who's, who's gonna pick up that, that, that gauntlet that was thrown down? Okay. Go on, um, Dan. Go on, Dan. You go first. I think I was going to say that in terms of that sort of schizophrenic kind of position you find yourself in, um, at the last UK conference, um, it sadly wasn't me that said this, but I thought it was a particularly excellent quote, which is the um, definition of true independence is if you give the same answer in, in, irrespective of which side that you happen to be appointed by. So taken that as the starting point, when it comes to identifying the warts um, in a party's case, that, that is effectively you very early on in the process looking to narrow those issues and identify the issues with, 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 within your client's case. That's, that is ultimately providing a service to the tribunal. It is not trying to gloss over these problems, it's identifying the problems and making sure that they are addressed early on in the process. And where you want to end up at the end of this process is you've agreed as much as possible on a professional basis with the expert appointed for um, the other side, leaving behind genuine, genuine kind of items of difference of opinion between the experts rather than advancing a position for your, for your client, because ultimately you're not there to do that. And even when you assist, when you're assisting counsel with 
preparation of cross examination, you're effectively identifying um, uh, within your opinion the problems with the um, uh, analysis and the assessments presented from um, your colleague appointed for the other side. So whilst it can sometimes leave you in a comfortable position, I don't think it's necessarily inherently schizophrenic, although it can often lead to uh, moments of uncomfortable discussion. <laughs> uncomfortable moments of uncomfortable discussion. I think that's a fantastic phrase. Um, Sean, your hand was up. What was it you wanted to say? Um, so I, I mean, I recently um, submitted a first stage report to a client who Now, is that me or is that, in, is that, uh, is that Sean? Is that Sean's side of my report? Is he... That's Sean. He's distorting. I'm distorting. Yeah. I, I can I can see that. Yeah. Um, hopefully, I should be okay again now. Yes, um, much better now. Okay, so uh, so I I recently had a, a, a first stage report that I submitted to uh, council and client team who track changed on the side of my report. Is he working for us or is he working for them? And I took that as being um, <laughs> uh, absolute recognition of that dilemma insofar as uh, I was as brutal with their position as I was or would be with an opposing position, did I not see the merits of the particular items and, and case? Yeah, no. And I think that the, the, the difficult conversation uh, point that's already been made uh, I think is exactly that you've got to be able to face up to those difficult conversations because there is no point in trying to pursue uh, uh, you know uh, irrelevant or uh, unsubstantiated uh, positions for a client when uh, when in fact you know you're just perpetuating uh, you know a conclusion that that won't benefit them and on that basis you are working for the tribunal and trying to make sure that you get through to a conclusion with something which stands on its own merits and, and makes objective sense. And the opposing expert can, can make the same observations. It's interesting, someone has um, already come into the chat box saying that moments of uncomfortable discussion seem to be the normal stock in trade for experts who are actually doing their jobs properly. Um, I've got um, Abdul's got his, his hand up and I've also got Matthew. Shall we get Matthew, do you want to go first? I mean, I think just following on from what Sean was going to say as well is, is, is that it's also the narrative, which is also something that is quite beneficial to a client. I mean, there's lots of times when I've been involved in an early stage dispute where it's very emotive. And sometimes what is actually the trigger points might not actually be worth, particularly when I'm looking at it from a quantum point of view, it might not actually be the substantial points in quantum where the parties are actually disagreeing. So sometimes you can just find that they're locked into something where actually, when you actually stand back from it and, and as an independent expert, you can say, well, actually, this is only worth X amount of money. And your bigger problem is actually over here where you might not actually necessarily disagree with some of the reasons as to why that's a problem. So I think sometimes as well, it's, it's just coming in at, at that approach and being able to really sit there and kick the tires effectively on the dispute and give an independent view. Um, you know, it can be, it's not just so beneficial to a client because it can effectively save them money in the long run, but exactly for the reasons that Peter was saying as well, is, is that it can also inform counsel at an early point to advise their client appropriately as to where they then want to spend money and invest money into a dispute that fundamentally might be hopeless or the issues might actually not benefit them financially at all if they do win. Yeah. Yeah, Abdul, what would you... Well, I just want to respond to a couple of um, observations and comments in the chat box and the, and the Q and A section. Yes. Um, th th there was there was there was a comment in the, in the chat box about well, isn't the um, primary primary um, obligation of the experts to the tribunal? It is, I think. But I think this is the point that that, that I think Peter was, was was driving at that there is a certain schizophrenia between the two in the sense that. Um, an expert wears two hats. He has an obligation, obviously, to the tribunal overall, but also owes an obligation to the parties to make sure that he gives them his honest opinion. And that's where you know there may be a, a tension sometimes. Um, the second uh, observation in relation to a comment in the Q and A box about you know, keeping experts out of court. I think this may reflect a fundamental difference in approach between law and common law lawyers. 
uh, in the sense that like, civil law generally doesn't put much stock in in, in cross-examination, where us common law lawyers really are very um, keen to have um, cross-examination. So um, I think it, it, it's unlikely that you're going to get a, a common law lawyer who's going to agree to have experts but not have them cross-examined. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, can I ask, uh, um, please, audience, can you stick everything? I will monitor both, but can you put it into the Q&A box? I think so that we can all be monitoring that as the primary source of questions. Who's actually acted as um, a, a clean or has been a, appointed knowing that they've got the role of a clean or a dirty expert? Has anyone actually had the experience of working in tandem in that way? Now that's interesting. I wonder if anybody in the in the Q and A or chat box has. Yes, yes, we've got, we've got one. Can you stick in your experiences about that? Because it's always held up as the way to manage this, but it seems to me to be phenomenally expensive, and I can see real practical issues in dealing with it. So I'd be interested in, in sharing the, the thoughts from the team. We'll keep to monitor, monitoring that. Can we move on to our next question? whilst we're waiting for that to come through. Um, and Robert, I want to bring you in here because I want to talk about whether or not experts, dis do we feel as a panel that experts are discharging their duties to the tribunal around the globe? So we've defined what they are. What's our gut feel? Is it actually being discharged globally? I take it as read that every one of you is doing it. We're not getting involved in that. But what's your feel? Uh, and Robert, you'll have a, a very different perspective on this, which in fact is probably worth starting with, because of course you come from a civil law background where experts are treated differently, or are they? Yeah, yeah thank you, Marin. Uh, we're talking about experts, and that brings up the first question, who is an expert, who shall act as an expert? And we have already recognized the, the term chartered quantities aware, which many people have in mind when they're talking about court experts related to construction contracts. Uh, but I have to say the term quantity survey doesn't really translate in every language. So, for example, my language, we don't have a word for that. We don't have an education which is similar. So in order to become a court expert or an expert in the construction fields, you have to apply in an auditing body just presenting your extraordinary experience and you have to pass some kind of an assessment. That is exactly the, the experience I, I wanted to make some years ago when I was already acting as an adjudicator for quite a while. <clears throat> so I applied for becoming an act expert in my jurisdiction. And in, in this application, I filed in that the key experience I have is from international contracts. And the surprising answer I got was not, not that it's not different, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the answer was, that's not of interest, you are rejected. Uh, so we don't need that competence. Of course, and that was quite interesting because it is simply not true. In many contracts, particularly plant contracts, we have significant international influence by a fitting NEC or other standard form of contract. So there's diversity. And as you said in the introduction, well, <clears throat> it took um, a few years and with the support of many leading construction lawyers and professor teaching uh, construction operation, we object to this and we gave evidence there is a demand for international experts because in many con uh, contracts also in my country are recently written in English language, they have all this international attitude. And so after a period, period of time, we managed that the decision of my rejected application was revised, but now confirming that there are two different types of expert needed in this case. So still now, uh, the achievement <clears throat> was made that now with fitted contract conditions, as a synonym for international contracts, uh, a specialist fi fi field for experts, but still the entrance is under the standard procedure to qualify as an expert for a, a German construction standard form of contracts. So the two points, <laughs> Uh, I want to make is here, uh, first of all, related to tribunals and parties, you have to select the right expert. And for experts, you have to be aware to what audience you are presenting. If they are aware of the procedures you are using, that's fine, but not then you're causing tr more troubles than you are good for your clients. It's interesting uh, because there is in the chat box, um, and I, I won't put the name, I say the name because of course you've got GDPR issues with that, um, but the, the, in the chat box, someone said, I've come across so many supposed expert witnesses that seem to just write up their paymaster's position with no interest to be seen to be independent. 
there are very few that carry out a true independent assessment. It is disappointing that those experts that in my opinion are partisan are from the large international firms. Discuss. Is that what we've come across? Do we feel that that's what's out there? Very Matthew. Obvious. Matthew. I was just gonna say, it depends on obviously the, the you know, jurisdiction, and obviously the country as well. I mean, I think the looking at the UK, I know we're not looking so much at litigation here, but obviously it's a good, um, you know, it's a good benchmark really for us to be looking at in the UK. But the TCC, you know, have really, I mean, over the last five years have been very, very critical of exactly that approach from experts. And, you know, there, there's countless number of judgments over the last period and judges where they really have been setting out that the TCC, particularly in the UK, do demand that gold standard and compliance with Part 35. So uh, I think in the UK, definitely a very different approach. Um, but, you know, taking, for example, the US, um, you know, the jurisdiction there is very different around the expectation of experts. And in fact, actually, you know, it, it, it's accepted that you advocate on behalf of your client and that you are hired gun. And that's part of the requirements that they expect of an expert. So it's again, it's very different the um, experts requirements in those jurisdictions. And there's other other places in the world where there is other similar um, expectations. So I think, again, it also depends on what rules and uh, procedures are the experts actually being appointed under. And what is the expectation and how are they actually being instructed and how should they be behave? Uh, so how, how should they behave um, really to sort of analyse and to compare one expert to another could come down to a jurisdictional difference. Yes, the jurisdictional difference is obviously going to be key. But I mean, does anyone I'd be interested to see if it, in fact that provokes in the chat box any debate as to whether or not do we have any Americans who accept that that is um, yes, coming in that the experience in the US is that the party appointed experts will generally act in the best interest of the party that engaged them, and that the tribunal must often remind the experts of their duty to the tribunal. But do we have a problem? I mean, when we talk about litigation, you're in the public forum, and, and naming and shaming works. But adjudication, arbitration, mediation, completely confidential, no access to a critical finding from the tribunal, whoever it is, about that expert. Is, that, is this perhaps one of those areas where we ought to think about releasing the confidentiality, saying that anyone who gives evidence as an expert in that private forum must accept that they could be the subject of public uh, comment and criticism? Anyone got any views on that? Yeah, Peter. I just uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of adjudication, the process is so fast. I have, I have seen expert reports which have, well, I'll describe the English bells and whistles attached to them. I've also seen expert reports saying I am deliberately not attaching these bells and whistles to them uh, because this isn't a report for court process. And in some ways, the latter is clearly the more honest approach. Yes, of course, the claimants experts can send weeks, if not months, producing a report of the same standard that would be produced in court. Though often, of course, they don't. What they produce is something which they call a provisional report. But the responding party doesn't have that luxury. In, in an English adjudication, even quite complicated ones running up to 10, 15 million pounds, which is sort of the topish level that I deal with, uh, you, you get perhaps three or four weeks if you're lucky. And in those circumstances, you cannot uh, produce an expert report which will look anything like the sort of thing that would be generated before a judge. And that's not the end of it, because then, of course, the poor guy on the other side gets two weeks to respond to the report, and they produce a response. And that response is basically responding to an expert report in the same manner that an advocate might respond to it, because that's the time scale. Uh, and, and the reality is that they often stray outside the field of their expertise. They make contractual points. Probably they wouldn't in court process, but the speed simply means they don't have time to think about it. They're simply responding. And, and to, to try and judge these poor people in the same sort of standard that you would uh, judge them if they were appearing in the luxury of a court case after many months, if not years, of preparing their material and having a chance to chew it over, I think is possibly a bit of a mistake. I think you just have to accept 
that in adjudication you are getting people giving opinion evidence and it's your job as a tribunal, usually without cross-examination, to simply decide uh, on the basis of what you've heard and your own background experience of dealing with these matters, uh, whose uh, evidence on particular issues is more likely to be credible uh, and more likely to be consistent with everything else you've heard than the other guys. And the approach that a court might take of this guy has not produced the right formalities for his report or it's questionable in some way and therefore I reject it out, out of hand, I think doesn't play very well in adjudication. I, I do think you have to accept that the form of adjudication is rough and ready for everyone, and, and that includes experts. And, and for these poor people to pilloried uh, in a public forum for what they generated in, in, in the context of an adjudication at great speed, I think would be a mistake. I, I have certainly criticized uh, experts in the context of my decision, but that's a mass private matter between them and the parties concerned. And one's very careful about doing it because of course, they don't have a right of recourse. And it's interesting, someone's, someone's made the point in the, in the Q&A box that in fact all it will do is drive people away from be, offering them their expert services and that they're already in short supply. Dan, you've been trying to come in on this. What, what's, what's your view? Just one quick item on this, which is the fact that whilst you may act for um, the, the parties and the clients fairly infrequently or only ever once in your career, there's a very small number of uh, law firms, particularly in the international arbitration market, and lawyers, no offence to any lawyers on the call, but as, as of any other field, move between firms with quite a lot of frequency. Um, and my experience, of, particularly of arbitration, is that the arbitrators are, are excellent with a lot of experience in the industry. And if you have an expert who puts forward a particularly partisan, biased or unindependent view, it is generally called out during the cross-examination process and it is generally um, picked up, identified and treated with less weight or with criticism by the arbitrator. Um, your career will be fairly short-lived if that happens with regards to the uh, way I would suggest the market works within the law firms. Um, irrespective of the comfort confidentiality within the wider press. Um, so, yes, <laughs> confidential, but only so far, I would suggest, in regards to your evidence as an expert. And the comments come through in the chat box that adjudication was meant to be rough and ready, so why is everyone surprised that it's sometimes not perfect? The... Uh, interesting suggestion coming forward, wouldn't a standard practice of tribunal-appointed experts put this debate to bed, essentially. Um, has anybody on this panel actually worked with a panel appointed when the tribunal has appointed its own expert? Peter, Peter, does it, does it work? Well, not, not necessarily, because, I mean, being blunt about it, there are various, an expert can have a range of legitimate opinions about something. And having one on each side means that you hopefully find the bit where the, the genuinely different opinions overlap. If you have a tribunal appointed expert, you only have his genuine opinion. And, and, and sometimes that opinion may uh, be at the range of what's acceptable, but there may be a lot of legitimate. The other thing I've found is managing these people can be extremely difficult. And I, and I haven't done it for several years for this very reason. Uh, once I appointed one and he just simply wouldn't do the stuff within the time scales that I was requiring him to do it. So the process that was arbitration became delayed, not because the parties weren't participating, but because the party, the tribunal appointed expert wasn't doing the biz. And, and the consequence became so dire that eventually I had to allow both parties to appoint their own expert because they quite legitimately, or one of them legitimately said the expert had forgotten all about it by the time he wrote his report. So I, I was not enamored of the process. And I do think that and again, this may be difficult in civil jurisdictions, but I do think hearing from two people who have legitimately different opinions, which they can su support by uh, evidence and support by rationality, is much more likely to come to a, whatever one wants to call the correct legal result or a fair result than simply having one guy who opines on a matter because sometimes experts like to hear the sound of their own voices and since there is nothing seriously challenging them on the other side, their voices can become dominant. 
That's interesting. I'm going to bring Matthew in because he's got some views on that. Whilst he's getting ready to collect his thoughts on that, in the chat box, someone is saying, in their experience, tribunal appointed experts work best when they're appointed to work with the party appointed experts and to identify points of common ground. So in this sense, the tribunal appointed expert is not acting alone. That's a very interesting idea. Matthew, you want to come in on this one? Yeah, I was I was going to really sort of just come back to to the first one uh, which Peter was addressing, which is that, that we we've seen Dana versus um, FST come out in the TCC a couple of months ago now, um, where um, Joanna Smith, uh, Judge Joanna Smith, uh, really was quite critical of the of the not just the experts but obviously the law firm as well, um, really around this whole creating a level playing field for experts, and in, and she certainly felt that one side had, had certainly treated expert evidence very different to the other side and um, I think you know one particular example of that was is that they even the fact that the experts had been to site and had seen um, walked around the project that didn't actually come out I don't think until the PTR or the hearing so it came out very very late um, so you know in her judgment she's very critical around all of this and I do wonder that then that does bring the debate around tribunal or court appointed experts and really is that the way to move forward to ensure that that level playing field is 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 given and maintained and the documents and and instructions and the like are provided on an equal basis to both experts so that that was really sort of my point but might might be some legal thoughts around that as to what as to the issues i'm going to bring abdul in um in on that and just to complicate the picture the question's been raised what's your opinion of a single joint expert uh, the questioner says, I found that they can be partisan without recourse to another expert to challenge the single joint expert's opinion. I mean, with. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think, yeah, with, with single joint experts, I mean, in court cases in the UK, the parameters in which, you can, which the court will be persuaded to appoint a single joint expert are, fa are fairly limited. Uh, and that's really the only. Um, no, no, I think, no, I think one, in one arbitration, I came across an international arbitration. But it's only really circumstances where both parties have agreed that look, it's really a question of counting the beans. Um, there isn't there isn't very much in dispute. Um, all it takes is someone to just run the numbers and give us the answer. So the, so the scope for dispute and the scope for controversy is fairly limited, given the nature of the of of, of the subject matter. And and and, and, that, and I think I think I think it's important to kind of to limit you know, its use to that, those sort of circumstances. I think using single experts, tribunal appointed experts. In more controversial, more controversial cases, leads to all sorts of um, complications and issues. Some of which Peter has already, has already highlighted. And I think, and, and, and I think we can see that the fact that the lack of popularity I think is indicative of you know, the, the problems that come along with, with, with that process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, look, Abdul, let, stay, stay with it because we're going to talk now. You're going to give us your views on the need for an international gold standard for experts. Yeah. I mean, what guidance there is? Does it work? Yeah. What should there be? Over well, I think as, yeah, sorry, as has already been, I think, illustrated in the, in the conversation we've had so far, um, then there are differences in, in jurisdictions as to the approach that, I expect, that, that, that is expected from, from experts. Um, as um, I think Matt's pointed out, and I think also, in the in the chat box, there have been comments to the effect that you know, in the US there's a fairly very different expectation of uh, of the expert, and and that's just, it's not limited just to the US. In various jurisdictions around the world, um, there are different expectations as to you know what's expected of the expert, principally in relation to to whom the he owe the, du the duty. Is he does he owe the duty to the tribunal or is it to the parties? How much of a high gun can he be? And when you look at the international arbitration space, there's precious little in terms of guidance for you know, somebody coming in and wanting to be um, an expert. Um, the only real sort of comprehensive guidance is, is the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators um, protocol on party appointed experts. The IBA rules on taking evidence make some reference to expert evidence, but it's very limited. Otherwise, yeah. there's almost nothing else out there generally um, on, um, on uh, by, by, by way of guidance internationally for people acting as experts. Now, you know, you, you, you can ask, well, is there a need for um, a standard? Is there a need for a gold standard? 
I mean, my view very, very much is that, is, that, is that there is. I think it will assist both the tribunal and the parties if there was a common set of values which are, which are enshrined in some generally accepted documents to the way uh, parties expect um, the expert to, to conduct himself in the reference. Now, again, with party autonomy in international arbitration, it's entirely it'd be, it'd be up to the parties, I would suggest, that if they don't want to adopt that, that standard, then that, that's fine. And then, and then as long as the tribunal is aware that that's the position, that's, you know, every, every, there, there's transparency as to what the position is. But I think, you know, there would be, um, uh, you know, it, it would be of great assistance to tribunals and to parties if um, there was something, so if there was a, a, a more broadly developed, more broadly adopted um, set of rules as to how experts are, experts are expected to behave, something akin to the Charter Institute um, Institute's um, Critical, critical, I think actually it's a very good document. The, the, only, the, only, the only downside to it is that it's not very well known and it's not, it's not very well, um, it's not generally generally adopted. And um, if it could gain greater prominence and greater, greater um, usage, I think that would be a good thing for the international arbitration space generally. Well, I, I mean, in the interest of transparency, I'm one of the trustees of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And so I would say that I wholeheartedly agree with you that their protocol uh, for party appointed experts is fabulous. I'd be very interested. Can we do a rough and ready um, chat box? Can you put in the chat, yes or no? Yes, I did know about the protocol or no, I didn't know about the protocol. Let's see if we can get some audience feedback on that. We're always short of data in this industry. What have we got? What are we getting? An absolutely mixed answer. Yeah, very, very mixed answer. How interesting. So there we are. If nothing else, we're going to out of arising out of this, we're going to take forward the promotion of that. That was interesting. Anyone else got any views? Um, anyone where we should be going? Matthew. And the other thing I was also going to add as well is it depends on your profession. I mean, with the, the RICS, they have a very comprehensive um guidance set of notes um around expert experts uh, sorry surveyors acting as experts um and it's actually a really good piece i, I think a very good um document very comprehensive and explains all the different approaches but it is drafted more towards arbitration because it does use the fine term consistent consistently of tribunal rather than court so it's, it's obviously somebody has got the, the you know the rics have, have drafted it with the intention of that they don't want to um, effectively redesign anything out of CPR Part 35, but that they are trying to up operate that to others. Now, that, that's great if you're acting as a, as a surveyor, but obviously in some matters, you might be appointed as a quantum expert, as a quantity surveyor, and you might be up an account against, say, an accounting expert or against an economist or somebody else that might be applying on similar sorts of matters from a different discipline. So I think going back to Abdul's point, I mean, it, it's right that that's not universal and obviously it requires surveyors to be aware of the document and to declare it in their report and to be, you know, to be working to it, which I'm not sure whether everybody is. Um, but it's it's one of those things that is out there. And I, and I think there are possibly others, but it's certainly not uniformed. No, I mean, I think of various institutes who offer the Institute of Experts um, and there's another UK based organisation. But globally, it is difficult to think of anything. Robert, I think you were waving your hand at me. Is this something that you, you have views on? He's You're on muted. Mute. You're mute. Ah, sorry. Right. I, I just Go want on. to confirm a message. I think there's an, uh, a demand for a gold standard and somebody has called it the clean expert and that would be identified. So somebody's really supporting directly the tribunal. It would be difficult to make a, a differentiation between an expert acting on adjudication, statutory adjudication or arbitration. I think it has to be just on the expert and how he presents his uh, services to the tribunal. Well, let's, um, can we now segue into something that I'm constantly being pursued about? And this is that as a lawyers, the feeling, I think, amongst experts, that lawyers get in the way. And that it's all very well, I hear. You know, we as experts, we understand our duties. The primary duty is to be objective. I'm there to assist the tribunal. I'm not there to represent my, the party that's paying me and their views. 
and yet the lawyers get involved and they start to make it difficult to achieve that task. Now, I, we could spend quite a lot of time actually saying, is that right? But I think that there is and there are lessons for lawyers as to how they could manage experts better to maximize that expert's performance. And I'd like to hear from every one of you, and I'm even gonna ask the lawyers uh, for their views. What's just one thing, one thing you think a lawyer could do that would assist the expert? And I think I should start with Sean. Ah, and Sean, and then I'll come, come to Abdul. I'm gonna try, I'll try and alternate it, expert lawyer. Sean. Um, I think um, the red pen is what irritates me. <laughs> okay, um, spend months and months and months writing in plain and common English because that's my education. Uh, I don't write legalese, I write plain common English. And then, and then the red pen arrives on the last traveling draft and uh, I get, you know, uh, uh, pushed to the extremes of my opinion by uh by legalese and and um uh, advocacy <laughs> about a particular item could couldn't you say it like this or couldn't you you know was isn't it more meaningful to say it like that uh, and and actually we've had that conversation probably five or six times throughout the process but they just don't let it rest <laughs> um i mean maybe we just need to kind of have that conversation once and be clear uh, to each other that that's our position and then stick with it maybe so it's the red pen put yeah. the red pen away yeah they, let, let, let me give my opinion yeah yeah abdul well sean has said john sean has stolen my, my thunder that's exactly what i, that's what I was going to make <laughs> no, as a uh, i mean as, as as a lawyer there is a temptation to get your red pen out and to try and lawyer and try and lawyer up the the, the, the report and you really have to try and resist that temptation. Um, you know, it's really important that you allow um, the expert to speak in his own voice. Obviously, if there, if there, are, if there are major issues um, with the report, then you should point them out. But I think I know, we've all been in positions where, you know, the red pens come back and the word is been changed to might or may or may be changed to, you know. So yeah, so the, so the, the, the going around making sure that you, know, you, you, you lower up all, all the language is sometimes counterproductive. So yeah, I'd, I'd completely endorse uh, what Sean says. Not that saying, I mean, I, I've, I've been in that position, I've done it myself, but um, hopefully as I grow older, I become more disciplined and I do it less. It's interesting. The chat box is alive with people saying that that's, the red pen has definitely hit a chord. It's, it's hit a sense of sensibility. Very interesting. Daniel, have you got, what's your one lesson? I think for me, it's very much the um, the way the arbitrations or the um, the hearings are run in terms of the serving of reports, where, where we have the procedures set out so that reports are served simultaneously um, by the experts. There's a real danger that you become ships passing in the night and you then end up getting to the point where either your statement becomes effectively a new report or you have another round of reply reports that again you just miss each other and that's not beneficial for the tribunal because we want to be trying to narrow the differences we want to be trying to assist the tribunal and I think where we have the ability to have a starting point with a starting set of analysis um, from which to, to work from and work towards together ultimately that's beneficial for the tribunal and results in the least number of differences at the end rather than just constantly missing each other. That's not sorted out by insisting upon there being a meeting between the experts. So a lot of it is but you've then missed two rounds where you could potentially have been narrowing items already and it has the danger that your joint statement is then trying to play catch up with the earlier reports and you even need to have your joint statement process happening much earlier or actually allow things to happen sequentially rather than consecutively. Now, the, it's interesting in the chat box, someone has just said a Scottish judge said recently, if gently, why would I think a Scottish judge would be anything other than gentle, that they expect to hear the expert's voice in the report. 
because we, we, we've, we've led with witness statements. So we've got the red pen, we've got the um, direction to avoid those ships passing in the night, which is, I know for any tribunal is a nightmare as to where we go. And um, Peter, one thing. Well, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to not answer that question, but I'm going to pick up on the last point. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, again, as tribunal, uh, and this would be arbitration, not, not uh, adjudication, uh, I, I, I've never understood why, and I always direct that at an early stage, once they've been appointed, the experts start talking and uh, they do a number of things. One is they try and come up with a common bundle of documentation that they're going to opine on. Uh, and two, uh, a common list of questions that they're going to opine on. Uh, and and uh, if they're going to inspect anything, they either inspect it together, or in one occasion where inspecting the thing was just so complicated, I suggested to the parties they actually appoint a single joint expert to carry out the inspection according to the brief of the others, so that not lots of people were tromping around on this roof, which is not a good idea in that case. Uh, and then that uh, they actually, uh, produce their joint statement at the same time as, they've certainly already started drafting it, uh, or within a very few days after producing the reports, because it is quite simply bonkers for two experts to produce separate reports, which of course expresses their honest and independent opinion and everything else you would expect them to do. And then a month later, come up with a joint statement saying, well, I didn't believe all that in any case, and, and, and we've actually compromised all the time, that's bonkers. Uh, they might as well do that exercise at the same time and generate a, a joint statement. Uh, uh, one of the other my bugbears is, of course, with uh, delay analysis, where ships passing in the night, well, they're actually not even passing on the same planet, not on the same night, is that whether they can discuss a common methodology and uh, solution to the problem of generating the ASCO program, which always produces complications, and uh, even discuss alternative methodologies and ideally agree them, or if they don't agree them, at least know why they don't agree them. And so this can, of course, then generate into their reports. So effectively, a lot more conversation between experts on major matters before they generate their reports uh, and, and, and that their, their joint statement is actually being generated at the same time. Well, there you are. Uh, and, and of course, sometimes, if I wanted to come back to your question, Sometimes uh, lawyers appearing before me don't uh, seem to approve of that idea. Well, there's my solution to how we could make it so they could actually approve that idea. And often they do. And of course, the other thing that happens, which is frustrating from my point of view, is uh, after they've talked a fair amount of time, you get that wonderful letter from the lawyer saying, Dear Mr. Abel, you will be pleased to know that the parties have now settled their dispute. Thank you very much. So maybe the solution to the problem is don't let them talk to each other at all. And then, of course, it might go on. Yeah. But, um, well, I think you very people... much have answered the question, which is agree to this approach. And it's coming up in the chat box as someone is saying that the order now adopted commonly is firstly the joint statement, secondly, the report on matters not agreed, thirdly, responsive reports. And I think it's fascinating the way the theme of communication and the importance of letting the experts speak to each other is coming out as a common theme. I feel the need to fight back and say that, you know, one person's red pen would be another person's insistence upon precise language. But I don't think I'll win that one, so I'll let it go. Um, Robert, any views? One thing, one thing that the lawyers could do, which would let the experts get on with it, and you can't use what's already been done. Well, I, I just have to use the red pen in a different way, so I'm, I'm not too <laughs> against the red pen issue itself, but what I don't like at all, if the lawyers start reading my report, before they have understood what I want to say, they start using the red pen, uh, and that's your language thing, I, which you mentioned exactly, so uh, as a rule, if you don't like my answer, don't raise a question, so I'm pretty stubborn on that point. So in fact, you're saying to the lawyers, listen, just sit and listen. Well, well if, if I have understood the, the case wrong, so that's why my answer is not suitable. I think they have made the presentation not sufficiently. We are not even at the, in front of the tribunal, so it's rather for them to think. Ah, that's an interesting perspective. Yes, make sure you make sure you give clear instructions. Abdul, before I come to you, Matthew, you've been quiet on this one. One thing. I think, think, think for me, it's, it's instructions, but there's two, two reasons why I say that. One is timing. And the other one is content of them. So with the timing, I think it's that always that compressing the timescale down for experts. I mean, I just don't think 
for the re reasons that Peter was addressing earlier about adjudication, I mean, that ultimately is not going to benefit really anybody. It's It certainly doesn't allow experts to really do their jobs properly. <clears throat> and sometimes it can also obviously, you know, cause issues with, with um, trying to reach joint statements and trying to do thorough analysis to actually get to a point where you could actually agree something. So I think the timings of instructions and get, getting early engagement is quite key. And I think even in the adjudication, I mean, um, I appreciate sometimes adjudications might um, yeah, be quite ad hoc and, and they, they are quite um, unforeseen in some circumstances. But I would say that the vast majority of them, parties know on a distressed project that it's already going out of control. What, why, why they don't then start to engage experts at an earlier stage in anticipation of adjudication to make those reports better for people like um, you know what Peter was saying when he's sitting there and trying to decide on that is ultimately only going to benefit the process so I think there's that and um, the content the only point I'd raise really around that is it's, it's trying to keep it as well quite fluid at the early stages I've had it where I've had instru instructions where they've already been quite narrowed or, or told me to look at something um, particular and, and it's restricted me in certain other areas and I think trying to keep those instructions quite fluid at the beginning part, particularly when you're trying to really uncover what's happened and what's going on and you're, you're doing your early investigations and trying to really not preempt what the, what you want the experts to do at that early stage, allow the experts to do the, to, to do, you know, the investigation first and then refine the instructions later if they need refining to a particular point that you feel that is only relevant to the matter. Interesting. Abdul, you, you had your hand up. Yeah, sorry, it has happened again. The point I was going to make has been made by, by Matt, so <laughs> I, I have nothing else to add to what Matt has said. And it's interesting, what's coming up um, in, in the chat box is uh, somebody said, Peter, what you said is wonderful, but if only the lawyers would permit such discussions. Now that I find intriguing. Is that your experience, that the lawyers just won't let it happen? Is that for me? Uh, it, it I generally, but Peter, you go Sorry, first. No, no, no I, 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 I'll pass for the people. Well, I'd be, I'd be interested in knowing, in, in, in practice, do you find as experts that you, lawyers do not encourage you to talk to the other side? I'm not sure they do. I, I, I wonder sometimes whether, it, I mean, obviously instructions come through lawyers, but I, I wonder sometimes whether it's also clients. I think there might be um, a difficulty there with clients trying to actually understand what that's going to actually achieve. And I think sometimes as well, for, for obviously tactical reasons, a particular client might have a real issue with that, or, or they might not completely understand what the benefit is to them at that stage. They might be feeling that if they hold strong and hold out until the end, it, it might benefit them better in, in that circumstance. And obviously expert fees as well. I mean, ultimately, sometimes that weighs in. The client might actually be saying to a lawyer, you know, I, I don't want to encourage expert meetings because it's going to incur more cost. I don't see the benefit. Let's just hold out and, and try and deal with it a different way. Yeah. So you're saying it can be driven by perhaps by a desire to settle and um, putting the experts together might expose a weakness, a commonly held weakness. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the experience of you, Sean? Dan, anything you want to add on that? Well, I've had experiences where... Um, where the parties between them have agreed no there's no 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 expert meetings no joint agreements no joint statements um they want to hold out to the tribunal and they don't want to see a meeting of minds about issues that are or aren't agreed um which you know uh i i guess was both parties you know right to be able to do that but um but on that basis, they actually formalised that as part of the procedure and said, "That's what we're going to do. You're not going to. There is no joint statements. There is no. Um, there, you know, there is no meeting of experts. Uh, and on that basis, you know, you get into your five-day uh, tribunal process, and you're talking apples and pears. Um, you know, there's more to unpick, and more to clarify, and more to align because of the disjointed process of, you know, report, report reply. Uh, and so, you know, on that basis, it takes kind of longer, but both party held, if you like, held firm on their positions up until the tribunal and let the tribunal decide for them. That's fascinating. And as you were saying that, I was wondering, how would I react if I was faced with um, a, an agreed position between the parties that there will be no meetings? 
because I, I mean, frankly, that my heart would sink uh, for all of the reasons <laughs> that, you, that you have outlined. How interesting. How, is that just once or have you come across that? Is, is there a particular reason for it? Does it come out of a particular sector or from a particular area of the globe? Uh, Paris, ICC, um, once. Uh, yeah. And a kind of UK, US entity and a Portuguese entity. Um, yeah. Nothing unusual to, to about you know about the parties uh, power sector, but just uh, the other side was pretty adamant, and and so both parties agreed that they were going to you know wait to the tribunal. Um, but but as I say, I mean, and then from watching, having been sort of in and out of the tribunal for a period of week, they spent a lot of time clarifying <laughs> what each side's opinion were uh, and the fact that there was a you know there was an apples and pears argument around a lot of the a lot of the issues interesting comment in the chat box uh, so it's obviously it's, it's not unique to you in one arbitration the lack of a joint expert meeting was justified to me by my instructing council on the basis that we were under common law adversarial rather than civil inquisitorial <laughs> Ah, well, there we go. I uh, think. So I, I suggest that I think expert meetings is an essential part, no matter what system you're under, and they are incredibly important for narrowing the differences and actually trying to progress things forward. But the point at which you choose to have them, just this immediate view that it should happen at the very start, isn't always that helpful because you do need the time to have actually understood the documents done some analysis actually formulated your own views and if you have the meeting too early on the first joint statement can sometimes be rather superficial and limited to or oh, we agree that these are the right sources of documents we agree this is the right starting point because no one's really gone further enough through the process of doing the analysis and actually progressing their own opinion to be able to start narrowing the differences and agreeing items so I think joint statement meetings are essential, you know, an essential part of the process, um, but the timing of them can dramatically influence their effectiveness and how successful they can be. I agree. And of course, never forget Jones and Caney, which established that experts don't have um, immunity, arose out of a mis an allegedly uh, mishandled joint meeting. So it is a moment of um, extreme sensitivity in any form of dispute resolution. Okay, well, look, now you've given the lawyers a hammering and told us how the lawyers are getting it wrong. <laughs> Let's turn the tables. Perhaps, perhaps not. Expert evidence is frequently said to be too expensive. It is, I think we probably agree, it is one of the most expensive elements in any budget for any form of dispute resolution. Can you identify one step that could be taken to reduce that cost? And let's make it hard, one step to be taken by the experts to reduce that cost. But I suspect you're gonna tell me it's gotta be taken by the client or the lawyers. Sure, go first. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I have a number of issues and I, I'm hoping go by the time I'm you've generous. gone through the panel, they'll, I'll, I'll still have you know, at least another one to go through. I mean, it's my, my, my view is it starts from the beginning and it's something that I think I've heard Matt and I've heard Daniel say the same things in some of the discussions it's the hurry up and wait scenario uh, your inquiry comes in it lands on the desk in your inbox on the phone call uh, urgent matter need a response need your team need your budget price need your you know need a methodology got to have it by you know three days time drop everything and we're going to be starting next week so you do that and you look at your resource and you look at the issues and you look at the complexity you look at the disciplines and you look at the challenges that you've got to face and you guesstimate broadly all of the things that you might be considering and then you put your proposal together and you send it off and then silence and so all that planning that you've done, all the resourcing that you considered, getting the right level of resource for the right tasks, the complexity of issues to 
a suitable support role around you as an expert or around the experts. And you plan the resourcing that you needed because you told you to start next week. And then nothing. And then three months later, you get the phone call, right, you're starting tomorrow. And all of that planning that you might have done has come out when you don't have the right level of resource, you've got what's available. And so the costs are what they are. Um, so I, I would say in a kind of non-career threatening reducing way, counsel, client, in-house counsel, instructing, lawyers, solicitors, Please, please, please. I'm afraid you're distorting very badly. Yes, you are. Can you Ooh. can you override? Yeah. I'll try that again. Can you hear me now? Yes. No. You are slightly better. Right. Okay. Is that better? You've you've got a very interesting Richard Burton echo to your voice now. Right. Now, okay. If, if, we're going to do, if we're going to do under milk wood, I think we're absolutely on the money. Okay. Um, so the point I was making, if you can hear me, okay, is that um, we need to be able to plan our resources, and we need to be able to put the most appropriate grade resource against the challenges and the tasks. We don't have a marching army of resources waiting for that instruction and the start. So allowing us time, giving us meaningful time to plan and start the project is very helpful to us to be able to keep this down. Okay, so it's hurry up and wait, no. And Dan, you were nodding your head all the way through that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, right. Over to you. One thing to cut I think, the cost. I, I think for me, um, something which I've had some frustration with over the years is where you pick determination based disputes, where you have a very binary legal question, first of all, you can find yourself having to do two lots of analysis and two lots of assessments, ultimately, one of which will never get used and will never even be considered by the tribunal. And whilst I appreciate that many clients will be wary of bifurcation um, and separation of quantum and law, because uh, it can actually extend the process and cost more from a fee point of view for the experts. If you can halve our amount of analysis to be done, you can halve the fees. Um, I had a particularly interesting case and I was very sad that I never found the tribunal's answer on it. It was a particularly interesting question because it just never arose once the conclusion had been um, found in the law, first of all, um, it, it just becomes a lot of wasted effort. Um, so, yeah, consideration of is there financial benefit to actually not having your experts undertake two sets of analysis? And maybe we are better off carving out issues. Because I think most, for most lawyers, I'll just bring you in on this point, you know, the concern is always when you start splitting things off, that the line between what is under consideration and what isn't is not clear, it's not understood. And in fact, as the case develops, you've drawn it at the wrong place. Do you have um, any comments on that? And, and what would be the one thing that you would suggest? Well, again, I, I think I would echo everything you've been said about the, 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 the Sean um, and, and, and Dan, both the, the points that they both, the, both made about um, looking at trying to ensure that, you know, we give experts as much time to plan their resources as possible. Um, I, I'd also add that I think so far as, you know, as we lawyers are, are, are involved, I think the clearer we can make our instructions and as early as we can make those instructions, the instructions, the better, because at least, you know, it gives the experts are clear here as to what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and again, I think while not wanting to micromanage the experts, I think it's important for um, counsel to be, to be brought in at an early stage so that we can at least try and identify what the list of issues are. And I think, I think, I think that that's quite important. The earlier you can develop a list of issues, even if it's just a preliminary list of issues, so that you, know, you can focus the discussion, focus the expert deliberation and that would certainly help you know trying to keep costs down and avoid experts going off on on on, on various tangents 
one thing that I've also found very useful is that um, I always ask, I usually ask for a briefing session with my expert as soon as I can, um, because I, I want to understand as a lawyer you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the technical case. And, and, that, and, that, and that would then allow me to ask more intelligent questions of the expert rather than asking you know, rather stupid questions um, later, 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 later down the line. So I think if you can have that kind of lawyer involvement at an early stage where the lawyer is given a briefing on the technical, technical issues, that I found has also helped help to, um, to, to reduce costs. Yes, and someone has also suggested, perhaps cheekily, cut out the 10 pages of caveats and restrictions. Now, I'm not sure if that's caveats and restrictions in the instructions or in the report itself or both. Um, perhaps we can have some views on that in a moment. But, but Robert, what was the one thing that you think could be done to save the cost? You're on, you're on mute. Sorry, again. Uh, if it's true that the best team wins the case, then uh, my suggestion is team up at the early stage and engage the experts and their opinion as early as possible, as more efficient they can work later on. So pay a little bit in front and you save it on the long run. Yeah, yeah, I can see the sense of that. Um, Peter, I think we haven't heard from you on this one. Peter and Matthew, who wants to go first? Oh, well, since Matthew hasn't leapt in, um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to take the point. It, I, 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 and it's the point that Abdul made about, from the point of view of counsel instructing the expert properly, I, I think that uh, I, I find that as a tribunal, at, even at the first meeting, it's useful to identify what people think expert evidence is required for, uh, and, uh, and provided you can come to a clear understanding what that is, direct accordingly, so that they don't just go off on a frolic and provide expertise about stuff. Uh, another time that it can be done is actually when pleadings are closed, you can actually say the expert evidence will relate to these particular pleaded issues. So again, both experts know the hymn sheet they're singing on. But that creates sometimes problems with the memorandum approach. Uh, in some memorandum approaches, the expert evidence is included with the memorandum. So you effectively get four expert reports uh, effectively talking to each other. Uh, I've found in practice, well, that works well with witness evidence. It doesn't sometimes work as well with expert evidence because the experts don't have the full factual story uh, when they're producing a report. So often with the memorandum report, I will actually hive the expert evidence off and say, exchange your memorandums, do your disclosure, explain your five memorandums then have your expert reports and joint statements because they then have a level playing field off which to work and of course they're only preparing one report each rather than effectively two reports each uh, which of course are responding to each other and of course once an expert starts responding to another expert report in writing it's amazing how they tend to drift off the impartiality plank because they're actually taking and scoring points off the other guy which of course happens in adjudication all the time. And there you are, perhaps there are some ideas. Yeah. And Matthew? Um, I mean, some of those points actually were, were similar to what I was going to raise as well. But um, yeah, I mean, have we seen with hot tubbing? I mean, it saves so much time during the hearings and, and obviously hearings are expensive um, and expert time and, and all, all those parties are involved in hearings and they're quite intense and people work in long hours and obviously it costs a lot of money to keep those things running. And I think with, with hot tubbing, we've seen expert evidence, you know, time in witness uh, experts in the box but that becomes significantly reduced. Tribunals feel, and certainly the court did during the pilot scheme, um, that the judges mainly all agreed that it was saving time. It was getting to the crux of the issues. They were able to understand the case. They were able to understand if they chose one alternative to what that meant to other repercussions, such as quantum. And, um, and I think following on from that, I've recently been involved with um, a, a very experienced tribunal um, that actually led the process where they required experts to attend CMCs and they, they required experts to become, uh, you know, to give regular updates as to progress and where they were. And, and actually they became involved in the instructions as well at one point as well. So um, I think certainly some international tribunals are certainly growing towards that and understand that these things, you know, that, that hearings and the whole process can become very costly. And I think that's definitely one way that the cost is definitely being driven down. That's interesting. So the experts were directed to be far more closely involved to attend the CMC. And, and you said that it actually involved in formulating questions. It did. 
Yeah, and 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 uh, things like instructions as well. The, the tribunal wanted the direct instructions through the lawyers um, to for the experts to do certain things, particularly where one expert was heading down one path and an expert was heading down another. They wanted to effectively get rid of those constraints around instructions, so that the experts could actually address the issues that the tribunal felt um, were key to the case. Yeah, yeah, we're coming back to those ships passing in the night again aren't we? Um, so comment in the chat box is coming up. The frustration for the expert is that is that a lawyer is not a construction expert and naturally asks questions. You then spend man hours educating, informing the lawyer about a con construction process or what an event technically involves. And it means the lawyer is pushing up costs for all parties. Now, of course, I have some sympathy for the lawyer in that scenario. 